Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really excited about tonight's topic. Uh, we'll be discussing everything you could possibly know about sugar and xylitol. Uh, but really quick, before we get started, just a couple things. Uh, you're all muted. Uh, if you have questions, make sure that you type them into the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll also have some time for uh, questions that come in, too. If we run out of time, we'll definitely get back to you uh, by email, so don't hesitate. Keep questions coming as they come to you. Uh, and if anyone wants to learn more, make sure to contact us about scheduling a meeting with, uh, with you and your team, and we can kind of go through things and, and answer more questions as well. Um, with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim Cooch, uh, CEO and founder of Carry Free. Uh, Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for 35 years. Uh, he practices here three days a week in Albany, Oregon. Uh, he's the world's leading authority in ATP as it relates to Carrie's risk assessment. And tonight we're going to uh, turn him loose on the topic of sugar and xylitol. Uh, he came to us last month really excited about some new science and evidence to support xylitol's role in treatment. So, uh, Dr. Cooch, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, Cody, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight from beautiful downtown Albany, Oregon, where it is summer and sunny, and I hope that you have all had a great day and are uh, enjoying a great season. So tonight's topic is sugar and xylitol. We're actually going to talk about sugar-sweetened beverages as well. Um, and I just want to go through, you know, to give you some perspective on it, um, you know, I mean, we all know that Americans eat too much sugar, and you know the short story is it's bad, and we have some hope with you know the use of xylitol in treating dental caries, and and I'll bring you up to date on some of the most current scientific literature on that. But you know the reason that we look at all this stuff is that it kind of just continues to develop the, the picture that we have about uh, you know our diet and dental caries, and and uh, the things that are important in terms of how does it relate to risk factors, so that you know you can pull these from these references. You know, as you're having conversations with your patients and you need to make a recommendation or you want to coach them through uh, making a behavioral change in their own life, um, it, it helps to have some of this kind of, you know, background and knowledge. To, and so it just continues to broaden our base. So I'm pretty excited about what I have to share tonight. And I hope that you enjoy it as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we know about dental caries, this survey came out this last year. This is from 2010, and it's, some, and it's our most current data. But... Um, we know that dental, untreated dental caries, and dental caries is the number one disease in the world. And I've, I've shared that with you, you know, for any, anybody that's been with us on a number of these webinars. You know, we've known that for a long period of time, and it's literally number one in every demographic in every country, literally in the world. And so we've got this huge pandemic of this disease, um, and untreated dental caries, you know, untreated lesions are, you know, affects 2.4 billion people worldwide. And it's uh, untreated primary teeth is a 10 most prevalent condition total, uh, affecting you know literally a third of a billion or two thirds of a billion children on the planet. So we know that this is a, a real issue and a problem for us. So you know untreated dental caries is number one. <clears throat> and contrast that to the dental profession, certainly here in the United States, I know that uh, oftentimes we have a lot of um, you know people from other countries that, that uh, listen to the webinars or sign in and join us. But you know, here in the U.S., since our our economic recession back in 2008, um, dental you know the, the dental profession has not recovered. In fact, we've been in what's considered negative growth. That means the total amount of dollars spent on dentistry in the United States is declining and has been declining for the last uh, you know six seven years. So you know. Out of the economic recovery, we've seen vacations and cell phones and big screen TVs and you know soft drinks and alcoholic beverages and all those things have recovered. Um, but dentist and, and healthcare itself is actually growing again. It's in the positive. But when you look at this graph, I mean you know dentistry is still you know lagging behind. So we have this, I guess, uh, abundance of disease and yet at the same point in time, the access to care or the amount of care being delivered is, is shrinking. So that that that's a concern. So when we look at you know what's causing this disease itself, um, the data that we have from about 13,000 patients now that we've collected over the last four or five years indicates that by you know by them self-reporting their risk factors, you know number one is so you know lack of saliva. Patients identify that they have a dry mouth. Uh, 63 percent of the patients identify that. Um, diet on our um, 
on our risk assessment form and the data we've collected about, you know, more than half of the, of the patients self-identify that they have a dietary issue as a component or a risk factor for dental caries. Bacteria, depending upon whether we were using a metric like the ATP meter or whether they, you know, report noticing the buildup of plaque on their front teeth. Um, bacteria is roughly about half, half of the patients have that as a known risk factor. And then, you know, genetics has been something I've been discussing here for the last two year, two or three years. Um, and that's really been kind of a wild card. We can't really identify or, or do specific genetic testing for patients yet, although I believe that you know, it won't be too long that we'll actually see a test uh, that maybe is available to us to start screening for some of those issues as well. But I know that in conversations with people who are doing this research, uh, their unpublished data at this point in time indicates that genetics alone could explain 40 to 55 percent of the, of the tooth decay that we see in the United States. So the genetics is a much bigger component to this than we probably had figured out or assumed. But at the end of the day, it always comes back to this is a, a disease of pH. <coughs> a long period of low pH driven by the bacteria, dysbiotic biofilm, that results in uh, net mineral loss from the teeth. So one of the things I've tried to teach using these usual suspects over the last few years is rather than get too lost in all the details and, and, uh, and, and make it too complicated, is just look for the patterns within your patients. You know, you go through the risk assessment form, but try and simplify it and think about, you know, what do I see going on here? Is this a dietary issue? You know, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight, really to talk about diet, you know, and how does the diet, you know, influence, you know, their disease state. We look at bacteria, you know, We've identified over 54 different bacterial species that play a ro role in, in dental caries, but at this point in time, we're really looking more as the biofilm as a whole, looking at which genes are present and which genes are being activated within the biofilm, kind of considering the biofilm itself as kind of a super, one large super organism, and, and a lot less concerned about which specific bacteria there, because they share, they share DNA, they share genes, and, and they cooperate in their, in their behavior. So it's not really a, a disease of a pathogen or two pathogens anymore at all. Even the good bacteria uh, can switch and become behave and behave badly. So um, those are, you know, that's kind of changing our disease model. When it comes to diet, Americans eat almost 23 teaspoons of sugar per day in our diet, and it's one of the, it's, a, it's probably the largest health issue that we have in the United States. We consume way too much sugar, and when it comes to high fructose corn syrup. We're number one in the world at weed, an average of 51 pounds per person per year in the United States. Now, to give you a little perspective, Mexico is number two at 32 pounds per year. So, I mean, we are off the charts in terms of our sugar consumption. And I think, you know, the cotton candy, you know, I mean, if anybody's ever eaten cotton candy at the fair, <clears throat> you know you're eating sugar. If you watch them make it, they put granulated sugar into that bin. <clears throat> and they spin it into the cotton candy and then it dissolves in your mouth and you know you're eating sugar. The challenge that we've got is you pick up some processed food in a package and you eat it and you don't, if you don't read the label and look what's in the content, you really don't know how much sugar is in there and sugar is in, literally in almost all of our foods and there's a lot of reasons for that and we're going to talk about some of those reasons tonight. Saliva we know is a huge risk factor and it's primarily in the United States driven by medications that cause, you know, lack of saliva or hyposalivation. And 70% you know, of Americans take one or more, you know, prescription medications every day and, you know, 50% of us take two or more. And, you know, I mean, we're a, a pharmaceutically based uh, uh, economy here in the United States. And then, of course, genetics, you know, we've identified 29 genes now that, uh, in, uh, that independently influence somebody's risk for tooth decay. So, um, genetics, and, and that's, this is a field that's still just developing. I think we've just seen the tip of this iceberg, and we're going to continue to see more and more growth in that area of research. But at the end of the day, dental caries is the net mineral loss from, from the teeth caused by, you know, prolonged periods of low pH, you know, as a result of this dysbiotic biofilm. So <clears throat> how does our diet influence caries risk? And, you know, what do we know about that? Um, well, number one, I mean, we know that if you look at some of the research in this paper, it's actually back from 2008, when we look at their diet, the two things that stand out is the, the amount of sugar, the frequency of their sugar intake, and the frequency of snacking. So, you know, one of the, the analogies I, I like to use is, 
you know, carrots. Let's let's pick carrots for example. Carrots are are a healthy food. Like we should all eat probably more carrots and eat more, you know, rabbit food in in, in our diet. But every time you eat, and it doesn't matter what you eat, the pH in your mouth drops. And if you go back to the Stefan curve back when we were in school, you know, your pH drops, and it takes a healthy mouth anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes for that pH to recover. During that period of time, you're experiencing demineralization on the surface of your tooth at the biofilm level, and then during the period of recovery, then the teeth remineralize. The problem that we get into is if you if you snack, continue to snack, uh, continue to eat even carrots, you're going to continue to drop the pH, and you end up with those prolonged periods of low pH. And we know from Philip Marsh's work that it's the pH that drives the selection pressure in the biofilm, not the availability of sugar. So having that, you know, prolonged periods of low pH are actually going to change the content, the makeup, and the behavior of the biofilm. So you could eat carrot, nibble on carrots like continuously all day long, and you would have been better off to bought a bag of M&Ms and consumed them all at one time and got that one exposure over with. Um, you know, so you know we can think of having healthy foods, but if you're eating incorrectly. You know, eating too frequently, snacking too frequently, even if it's a healthy food, you're still going to end up with an issue. So, you know, we really, for our patients, that's kind of a challenging concept for them to understand. Now, I don't recommend that my patients go buy a bag of M&Ms as an answer to their snacking, but, but I think it's important for them to understand that it's really about frequency. If you're going to have a Mountain Dew, have it. Have it with a meal, drink it, and get it over with. Don't buy a Big Gulp and sip on it for eight hours continuously. So you know that's the gulp, dump, sip. That's kind of the message there. So there's two things about our behaviors with diet that are important for us to understand. And then you know another thing that influences our diet. And again, this goes back to genetics. This was just published in the Carriage Research Journal. And you know there are sweet taste genes. And so people that have the TAS one R two or one R three gene, uh, we certainly know that the TAS two R thirty eight. Uh, gene for bitter taste and the phenols that those pa that those kids or patients people are really susceptible and sensitive to those bitter taste in some of the different vegetables. Uh, but there, are, on the flip side, there are also genes that influence taste for sweet. So when you just say somebody has a sweet tooth, they probably have uh, either you know a couple of these different genes that are influencing you know what they select and how they respond to food as well. So part of it is. Um, Part of it is, you know, how we eat, what we eat, and then some of it may be driven by our genetics as well. In this study, they took 184 seven to 12 year old, uh, you know, adolescents, and they looked at their DMFT scores, and then they looked at their genetic makeup, and then they, they tracked these two. And these genes actually have been known for a while, but starting to look at how those correlate to their, you know, to their dental caries rate. But certainly, having a sweet tooth, having a sweet gene, influences your diet. So when we go to a caries risk assessment form, and this is a carry free form, you know, these are represented by, you know, the diet. We're we're asking those self reporting questions there. You know, number one, do you drink liquids more other than water more than two times, you know, between meals during the day? And we're talking about sugar sweetened beverages there. The next one we're looking at snacking. Do you snack between meals? You know, having one or two snacks between meals total every day. Uh, two seems to kind of be the threshold. When you get to three, you start to run some, you know, increase your caries risk. So that frequency of snacking, we're asking two different things here. You know, one is your sugar intake through sugar sweetened beverages, and the second one is like how frequently you snack. So then I ask that patient, you know, so uh, you know, in a, in a given day, like how many times would you estimate that you probably snack on something? You know, and, and it, you know, you, you kind of want to be non-judgmental. <coughs> If you want to be successful at you know helping the patient, and so you know we want to ask you know open-ended questions and you know say you know tell me more about that you know kind of that coaching language. So what do we know about sugar when we break it down? Well, the one thing we know about sugar, and this is a study that was published in 2013, and a lot of some of this research has even been done here at OHSU in Oregon, but we know that sugar causes more excitation of pleasure centers in the brain than cocaine. And rats in studies, given the choice between sugar and cocaine, pick the sugar. So, you know, if we want to talk about so the first thing we know about sugar is that it's addictive. And this is probably something that, you know, was ingrained into us, uh, you know, so that we would search and seek out higher calories when, you know, when food wasn't always readily available to us, you know, and 
and you know we really our our bodies were engineered on feasting you know when the when there was the, an opportunity because there would be you know periods of famine um, so that's kind of you know cyclically throughout the year you know it, it you know as we developed you know as human beings as you know um, as a species we didn't have an Albertsons or a Safeway that had uh, year-round uh, fruits and vegetable gardens you know in abundance so you know we ate those things seasonally but now we eat them like year-round so you know that and then that's changed in the last hundred years so that our, our dietary changes, you know, our bodies and things haven't caught up with that. But certainly the bacteria are having a party right at the moment and, you know, uh, and creating a lot of dental caries as a result of that. So sugar is more addictive than cocaine. One of the things that we also know, this is a study from back in 2012 in the International Journal of Pediatric Dentist, Dentistry. And one of the things they looked at is looking at risk factors on children. One of the things that we know early on is their dietary habits contribute to their risk for uh, early childhood caries and, and certainly again also uh, the frequency and intake in sugar. You're going to see that story repeated in, in, more, in a bunch of the more recent literature as well. So certainly our diet is one of our first risk factors you know as kids. Um, and this was a study then that looked at, at children again. We looked at in this study there were 100 uh, uh, six to twelve year olds they looked at their diet uh, for a period of seven days they had did basically a diet analysis on these like you know grade school kids and then compared that to their DMFT scores and what they observed was and this shouldn't come none of these studies will come as a shock to you but it just gives you the scientific evidence of support to have these conversations with your patients you know the more sugar that the kids that had ate more sugar those 54 percent and had a, a frequent intake of both sugar sugary foods and sugar sweetened beverages over a longer period of time those kids had much higher DMFT scores so uh, that's what we'd expect and that's what we saw in the study so you have the evidence to support that you know the frequency of sugar is going to be a problem yeah now, a lot of these studies have been done on kids but a lot of other uh, these studies some of them have been on adults as well this was a, a systematic review and this actually ended up coming out of the World Health Organization guidelines and this came out this last year uh, and it was published in December and the challenging part of this is it, it came into uh, several additional studies but they actually looked at and this was a systematic review they, they uh, looked at 5,990 papers they included 55 for the review there were three um, intervention studies, eight cohort studies, 20 population studies, and 24 uh, cross-sectional studies. And at the end of this, what they came up with was if you have less than 10 percent of your dietary energy intake is sugar, um, you have a reduced risk or you had reduced DMFT scores. And if you were below 5 percent, it was significantly, there was a, uh, a significant correlation. However, um, the evidence was judged to be of fairly low quality, so it's not something that we could make, you know, strong scientific conclusions on. Although it gives us, I think, good recommendations and a good basis. So this is followed up then by um, you know, the BMC Public Health. This was published then in the last year as well. You know, there's a robust log-linear relationship of dental caries to their sugar intake from zero sugar up to 10 <coughs> percent. So the findings suggest from a public health measure that we should be, you know, our goal should be 5% um, or less of our diet per day uh, in sugar and, and actually our target really should be 3% or less. So when you, when you break that down, we're talking about um, 50 grams is, you know, 10%. Um, 25 grams would be our tar would be our goal, and, and realistically, we should be talking about um, 15 grams or less. If you look at how this comes out, it, it looks to be about two thirds of a teaspoon per day of, of sugar. And currently, we're eating about 23 teaspoons. And so, one of the things that I do when I speak, uh, you know, at dental meetings is I have a little, you know, baggie, uh, Ziploc baggie with 23 teaspoons of sugar in it, and then I have another Ziploc baggie with literally two-thirds of a teaspoon of sugar in it and the when you see those two, you know you can talk about it but when you actually see that and get the visual image of, of what the disparity is it's pretty shocking now you know I don't know how you and I are going to solve that as you know a problem a health issue in, in our society here but 
certainly we can start to counsel and, and coach our patients kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a, this is a huge issue um, in the U.S. And when you look at how much sugar that we eat now, um, it, it's shocking. So we want to get our sugar consumption, you know, below 3%, and then that really, this comes from JATA, so that really means that uh, we want to get, you know, from the 50 grams that people are currently eating down under 25 grams, we literally want to get to 15 grams. We really want to get to two-thirds of a teaspoon of sugar per day. You know, and, and in the day, you know, you know, 200 years ago, sugar was a huge luxury item. You know, I mean, it was very expensive. It was in limited supply. And, you know, so the average American ate consumed less than like, you know, five pounds of sugar um, per year. And now we're eating, you know, over 100 pounds of sugar per year, you know, per American. So obviously that's going to change our diet. When you go to developing countries, I I've seen the same thing, whether I was in, you know, some African countries or in Asian countries. Um, sugar is a luxury. So one of the first things that these societies do and for the, you know, for the children is to have sugar in their diet, to have candy. I mean, those are huge things for, for children in other parts of the world, particularly in developing countries. Well, you know, you change your diet and you start just adding sugar to it and, you know, you really, you know, upset the apple cart. So um, sugar consumption is a huge issue for us. Uh, this is a study that was published on Chinese children. They looked at 133-year-olds and they examined them at baseline and then they re-examined them at, at 6 and 12 months later. And what they found was any of the children that started consuming sugar or particularly sweets right before bedtime, that was the worst, you know, outcome in the study, was that it was a period of about six months and they started to see a, a microbial change within and a behavior within the biofilm. And, you know, they started to then, you know, see uh, dental caries and their DMFT scores start to increase. So, um, you know, sugar in kids, uh, it's not a good, it's not a good recipe. But, you know, we, we see that happening kind of worldwide. Um, the other thing that, you know, here's yet one more study, and this was the Carey's Research Journal of this year. They looked at 106, or I'm sorry, 1,062 seven-month-olds, and then they followed them at, and re-examined them at age 3, age 6, 9, 12, and, six, and age 16. And they looked at the sucrose intake at, at you know, at seven months of age, and then they looked at really at age three, and at, by age three already, that heavy sucrose intake was already associated with high levels of mutant streptococci and lactobacillus, uh, which you know, because that's an old disease model, but those are easy bacteria to culture and look at. <coughs> Certainly, they're participants for most patients. They're part of that. They're part of the story. Um, and then the increasing the DMFT scores all the way up to age 16. So, you know, that diet on children early in life, it's really important to counsel your young, your young mothers um, about sugar and their sugar intake. In this study, they looked at both the extra insoluble polysaccharides that are found in the biofilm and then also, again, uh, just solid sugars, you know, candies and sweets, uh, and compared it with their visible plaque scores, carogenic microorganisms, and it, and it partially, that partially explains you know, the pattern of uh, early childhood carries. In this study, they looked at 63 one- to uh, four-year-olds. They did a baseline, and then they re-examined them at one year. And so, again, the solid sugar is certainly an, an issue in terms of DMFT scores in kids. And then this is one of the last studies on sugar I'm going to share with you this evening until we get to the sugar-sweetened beverages. But in this study, I thought it was quite interesting. They took 96 children that were 6 to 11 years of age. They looked at their fat mass. Um, and their non-fat body mass. You compare that to DMFT scores, the, the frequency of sugar-sweetened beverages and sugar itself, and food intake, you know, snacking between uh, meals. And what they found was that all of those correlated to an increase in DMFT scores, but all of those also correlated to an increase in childhood obesity. So, you know, this is a major health crisis for us. You know, the, you know this, this whole sugar issue is a major health crisis. It's not just dental caries, but it's also about diabetes. Um, it's about obesity and certainly in adults' hypertension. I mean, you can go down a list of the issues that that, that kind of sugar intake. And our bodies just weren't designed to eat that much sugar. So, on the other hand, it's addictive and it's unavailable. So, that's an issue for us. Um, and then, uh, and I wrote a blog on this, I think in April, and you may have seen that, but, you know, this really, <clears throat> this really gets me, uh, <laughs> this really grinds my gears. But, you know, following World War II, 
Uh, during World War II, sugar was rationed. I mean, I can remember my grandparents, I'm 60, you know, I can remember my grandparents showing me little stamps and coupons that they had, and you saved up your coupons, your, your rations, and then you got to buy, you know, a pound of sugar. And so during, you know, World War II, because we were rationing, trying to, you know, support this war, um, people stopped eating sugar, and Americans got used to not consuming sugar. And so if you look at uh, the sugar consumption rate, you know, you look at the data in the charts, I mean, it dropped, it was on a steep decline. And actually, once their palate had changed, all the way through the 1950s, continued to decline. And so what the sugar industry did, the sugar lobby, big sugar, sugar lobby, got themselves, had representatives on our, on our committees within the, the, within the U.S. Congress. The lobbyists were on the committees and focusing on increasing consumption of sugar. So rather than showing what the, what the issues were around it, they actually invested money to help Americans understand that it was safe and you know sugar is safe and healthy and natural and it's good to eat <clears throat> and focus on the positive aspects of sugar rather than the downside of what the outcome could be. And when it came to dental, um, rather than focusing on its you know increased risk, and the ADA was involved trying to reduce sugar consumption and reduce the amount of tooth decay in the United States and the sugar the sugar lobby actually uh, you know promoted the use of fluoride you know sugar is good uh, fluoride will take care of the problem but it's okay to eat more sugar and the fact that the sugar lobby had that much power and it's had that much influence in this country I mean it, it, it's really I guess it's not shocking but it, it really disturbs me anyway so I wanted to share that with you if you go look at I mean all the data all the paperwork is there I mean there's a paper trail on this so the sugar industry has certainly pushed this upon us as well. You know, so what do we know about sugar sweetened beverages? Other than <laughs> other than if you stop at the quick mart when you're filling up with gas and you want to get something to drink, um, good luck finding anything that doesn't have sugar in it with the exception of unsweetened iced tea and water. And you know, a lot of the water is uh, acidic and we've talked about that before. So um, you know, good luck with that. Um, one of the things we know is that this is such an issue in the United States. Um, that is something that we need to talk to our patients about. We need to talk about sugar sweetened beverages. You know, I think that, I think that really calls it for what it is, and it's everywhere. Um, I, I know that we think of these sports drinks as being healthy, and you go look at them, and you know, the number one ingredient after water is sucrose. So, you know, athletes who are dehydrated, or trying to rehydrate, it's for all those ions, all that stuff is great, but you got to be aware of the fact that what you're drinking is sucrose. You know, it's sugar water. So. Um, I think those are really good conversations to have with patients. Just, you know, when you ask them what they're drinking, you know, because they don't know. I mean, I've had so many conversations with patients when I asked what they drank and they told me and it was a sport drink and they thought they were doing something really healthy for themselves. When I said, did you know the number one ingredient in that is, is sugar? I mean, they were shocked. You know, they had no idea because they just hadn't looked at the label because we don't assume that. So this is a really good graphic. I need to build one of these for my dental office and hang it up on the hall on the wall. Because I mean, when you look at if you look at these, of course the bottled water, and of course we want them to be drinking a water that's in neutral pH, not a pH of four. And you can figure out which one of those are by just doing a Google search. But you start looking at our beverage choices here, and look at how much sugar. I mean, there's you look at that sugar bag on the end there with the Coca-Cola can, and it's like you can't even conceive that you could get that much sugar into a can and have it in liquid form. Like it, it ought to be syrup. And, you know, nobody would think, nobody would think to go grab that bag of sugar and consume it. Nobody would do that. But nobody thinks twice about picking up a Coca-Cola and not realizing that when they're having that Coca-Cola, that's actually what's it what they're consuming. And I think so these are really kind of cool graphics that, that I think can help patients understand and make better choices, certainly in, in sugar sweetened beverages. One of the things that came out this last year, um, and this was a study that was done on 2,292 to five year olds, and they looked at their diet, in particular the consumption of 100% fruit juice and then their DMFT scores. And then this like hit all the major news stuff like in January. I mean, this was huge, and, and the message, the takeaway that the, that the media got out of this was that, and maybe it was driven by the big fruit juice lobby, I don't know, but um, the, the message that they took away was that fruit juice doesn't cause dental caries, so having 100% fruit juice is safe. Give your kids fruit juice. Well, the, the bottom line in the study was it's only safe 
if they have four to six ounces per day one time with a meal. And then it did not contribute to appear to contribute to the DMFT scores on these kids. You know, and so let's look at what that means. I mean, we have a, a portion distortion here in the United States to begin with. And so you look at 100% fruit juice, yeah, that's better than, you know, maybe some alternative drink choices. But at the same point in time, uh, you can't just freely give your kid fruit juice all the time and assume it's not going to cause or contribute to, to tooth decay. The American Academy of uh, Pediatricians has recommended that children one, of, one to six years of age consume no more than four ounces of fruit juice and from a cup, not a sippy cup, from a real cup um, so that the kid you know, doesn't sip on it and carry it around and you know, sip on it for hours, more likely that they're going to you know, drink the cup than if you give them a sippy cup. That's something that they're going to snack on for a prolonged period of time, which we know that's a bad behavior. Um, and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry rec recommends avoiding sugar-containing beverages in a baby bottle and no spill, uh, spill training cup, and infants should not be put to bed with a bottle that has any sugar-containing liquids. You know, so that's, uh, you know, this is my hand, and that is a 5.5 fluid ounce uh, can. That's a portion size that we're talking about. It fits in your hand. It's those little tiny cans of, you know, orange juice or fruit juice, one time per day with a meal. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're talking about here. I threw this in. This actually doesn't contribute to dental caries, but this was a study done on um, young adults. And in this study, they had 3,773 20-year-old uh, plus young adults, and they looked at um, consumption of fruit drinks and then looking at it with tooth erosion or tooth wear and tooth loss and mineral loss. And so uh, what they found was that uh, it didn't increase uh, the prevalence, but it was associated with the severity of mineral loss or acid erosion on the teeth in these young adults. On the, on the flip side of that, uh, grape juice did not tend to be associated with that. So, um, you know, I think, you know, if you want to have some wine, red wine, uh, you know, you're probably not going to hurt yourself. In, in in moderation, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You know, we we live in a land of Pinot Noir here, so uh, the big Pinot Noir lobby is is uh, you know is a powerful organization. But so fruit juice also contributes to erosion. This was a very interesting study, and they had patients rinse for 10 seconds, swish with uh, orange juice, uh, a cola-based soft drink, and then a 10% sugar solution with water, basically. And they had them swish with that for 10 seconds, and then they used a microprobe in their saliva to see how long it took for the pH to recover. Now, the um, pH of the orange juice was 3.5. The pH of the cola was 2.5. And interestingly enough, um, even though the pH was higher on the orange juice, it took three times longer for the pH to recover from that rather than from the Coca-Cola, or well, not Coca-Cola, but the cola-based soft drink. Um, the pH in the mouth of these people recovered in about 30 seconds with the cola drink, but it took 90 seconds after the uh, after the orange juice. And there's a difference between pH and the titratable acidity. And what the titratable acidity means is like how much alkaline material do you need to continue to add to that to get it back to neutral? And so even though it has a pH of say 3.5, it may have a lot more acidity in terms of having to titrate, how much do you have to add back to get it to be neutral? And in orange juice, um, that was particularly a, a bigger problem than it was with the cola drink. So uh, I thought that was a very interesting study. It's not just the pH, but it's actually the titratable acidity that, that creates an issue. And the, the water and sucrose didn't really have much of an effect in the mouth, a lot, a lot less than we would have anticipated. So the orange juice, even though it had a higher pH, uh, took longer for the mouth to recover than it did for uh, a cola-based soft drink. And this was a study that looked at um, the frequency of the consumption of these sugar-sweetened beverages and also sugary medications, and also looked at a failure to use you know, fluoridated rinses and compared it on 106 to 15-year-olds and looked at them over a period of time and found that, it, that those were positively correlated to an increased number of early caries lesions, particularly in patients with a high prevalence of dental caries to start with. So you've got a high risk caries patient, you know, these are just not good drink choices. Um, and certainly the diet beverages, um, 
are probably a better choice, although there's a growing body of evidence, and I don't have any of those studies in here, but there's a growing body of evidence that even diet drinks, the artificial sweeteners that we were using in some of our diet drinks, um, may contribute to metabolic syndrome and diabetes um, as they trigger the pleasure center in the brain, then there aren't the calories, and so you get a blood crash, and people actually consume more calories as a result of drinking the diet drink. There's a number of studies that have been published just recently on that. So, um, you know, the safest thing to drink is is water, and past that, you know, it's probably uh, if you're not drinking milk, you know, if you're drinking water, probably the next thing is unsweetened iced tea. So I try and steer my patients kind of in those directions. Uh, this was a study that was a, a cross-sectional study um, um, on it was uh, on 76 adults uh, in southern Illinois. There was fluoridated water in this area, and they looked at uh, you know dietary factors and oral hygiene, uh, both contributing to dental caries in young adults living in this community. Sugar-sweetened beverages was a much stronger indicator of dental caries than snack food consumption. So. When it came down to like at the end of the day, what was the worst thing here? Um, the sugar sweetened beverage was uh, was number one in terms of correlating to their DMFT scores, followed just by their diet, and then last was hygiene. You know, was their oral hygiene index. So the sugar sweetened beverages is certainly a, a, an issue. And then when we look at children, um, this was a study that was done uh, and published uh, earlier this year. They, in the study, they looked at uh, 1,274. Uh, 10 to 12 month olds, and then they looked at them again uh, at six years of age. And so what they found was that again, this early introduction of sugar into the diet into a child, you know, about the time their teeth are erupting, uh, significantly increases the likelihood of having dental caries among, you know, once these child these children turn like six years of old uh, of age. So, um, you know, that that time period is really important with a with a young parents, you know, they're 10, 12 months of age, they maybe have been breastfeeding, maybe maybe weaning the child from breastfeeding. Now they're got they have to make some decisions on, you know, what are we going to feed, you know, our child, what are we going to put in the bottle? Uh, you know, if it's not going to be milk or formula or what have you. Um, it's a really important time because it's critical. It's a critical window. The teeth are erupting and if we give them, if we make bad choices, it dramatically increases their risk for tooth decay by the time this kid's six years old and can start school. So sugar-sweetened beverages are just not something you want to give, you know, small children. Um, and then this study was done on 939 adults. It was a, a four-year-long trial, and they looked at adults that were having um, one to two and three or more sugar sweetened beverages daily and then they looked at their DMFT scores and what they found was that obviously adults that were you know one to two even one to two uh, sugar sweetened beverages per day um, led to basically wasn't a lot different than people that had three or more they basically increased their uh, DMFT scores by 31 and, and 33 percent so the message there is I mean you know you got to be careful with these sugar sweetened beverages. Even having one a day uh, can increase your risk for tooth decay by, by number of cavities by a, by you know a third basically. So um, and this is on adults. So it's something again. Those are the kind of conversations that you can have with your with your patients. Xylitol is interesting, and we continue to have. I'm going to show you the the. the you know, this is a fair and balanced presentation. I I. I I'm a truth teller, so it's like we've got to weigh all of our scientific evidence, and you know some of it comes back and looks really good, and some of it doesn't look good. But so then you have to weigh kind of through which ones do you want to um, put your weight and confidence in, you know, which studies. You know, what do we know about xylitol? Well, we've known this for a long time. We know that fluoride and xylitol together have a synergistic inhibitory effect on acid production of methane streptococci, and we know that xylitol even in Small amounts has the potential to enhance uh, even low concentrations of fluoride. So, one of the things we talk about in the shotgun effect, trying to address more than one risk factor, having more than one therapeutic strategy bundled together, so that the patient doesn't have to make numerous behavioral changes. Trying to be able to target as many of those together as we can, we know is a good idea. We've always known that for a long time. So, fluoride and xylitol, in my mind, should be used routinely. Should be used together. <coughs> 
And this was this is an older study um, on children, and it was from mothers who were you know chewing gum, and the mothers who chewed gum you know containing xylitol had dramatically less um, transmission of uh, decay in these bacteria to their children than mothers who were you know chewing even chlorhexidine and fluoride. So there's less caries with uh, xylitol gum, and this this one was an 18-month clinical trial of uh, mother and children pairs. Uh, they looked at 60 60 mother child pairs, and they followed them over a period of time. What they found was that you know significant reduction of um, mutant streptococci and plaque scores, as well as caries ex caries experience in the mothers that were chewing xylitol gum, and this went over a period of 18 months. Uh, Cody, my my uh, headset is beeping, which I'm not sure what that means. So I don't know if my battery is uh, is going down, but if uh, for some reason you can't hear me, uh, uh, if everybody can hear me, we'll just continue. But uh, and I'll ignore the beeping. Oh yeah, I can use that as well. Hang on. Set. Um. So the xylitol gum in this study is very interesting that they had um, 107 Japanese mothers. They gave them xylitol gum three times a day, uh, and then they looked at them uh, 13 months later, or it was actually the intervention was for 13 months, and then they looked at them 15 months after the end of the interve intervention. And what was interesting was that it significantly, the xylitol gum significantly decreased the amount of mutant streptococci during the intervention period, but it still depress those levels of mutant streptococci 15 months later after the intervention was over. So xylitol appears to have some effect that's you know longer lasting in terms of changing the behavior of the of the biofilm and the content of the biofilm. So it tends to have, you know, based on these studies, a long-term effect as well. And then we come down to January of, of 2013 and, and this is Bader and, and Sugar's study. Uh, this was the um, xylitol adult caries trial, and they looked at 691 adults. This is a three uh, multi-site study, and they looked at over a period of 33 months. These people were, I think, from 18 to age 75, and they gave them five xylitol mints a day. They were all high caries risk, and this is the only intervention in the study, so they gave them xylitol mints. And the conclusion was, at the end of the 33 months, there was no difference from the patients that got a placebo or nothing versus the patients that received the five xylitol mints. So the xylitol had no effect uh, in terms of reducing the caries risk on these on these patients over a 33 month period of time. And I have to tell you, as we continue to try and address this disease, so you know the conclusion was, and, and again the media read into this, and I mean I literally saw New York Times, xylitol's a fraud, it doesn't work, all the you know, anti-xylitol people came out of the woodwork, and it's like, see, we told you it didn't work. It was a waste of time. Xylitol, you know, et cetera. Well, we we have a tremendous amount of research on the transfer of this disease from mother to child, of xylitol chewing gum. You know, the fact that you would take these adults and give them five xylitol mints, and that's your entire intervention, and that didn't have any effect on the dental caries doesn't surprise me whatsoever. I mean, you need to target your strategies if you want to be effective. You need to target them to what the actual risks are, and when we design our, our therapeutic strategy with our patients, that's what we're doing. You know, so you know, we get to the end of the study, and you know, and I heard I I got more emails and more responses and questions from dentists than from any other study that I've ever seen published. And you know, so the conclusion was out of the study is well, xylitol doesn't work; it, it has no value. So everybody saw that it was in data, and then it hit all the major news media. You know, two years ago. Well, the interesting thing is. This was the secondary analysis of the data from that same study. They looked, re-examined the data, and they said, okay, now let's see if there is any particular group that benefited from the xylitol. And when they looked at the adults that had root surface lesions and root surface dental caries, what they found was that these five xylitol mints a day reduced their caries rate by 40%. That's a huge nut. When you start talking about carriage interventions, 40% is huge. I mean, if you get to 25 or 30, you're, you're celebrating. 40, you almost never see anything that high. So just the fact that five xylitol mints a day would reduce the decay rate on somebody, but it was targeted. 
So it was for whatever reason, whether it stimulated the saliva or also the bacteria on you know that biofilm on those root surfaces, whatever raised the pH, whatever it did, um, it had a significant impact on those patients. And so we could target this and know that it's going to have a benefit. However, you know, no, this was published in the Journal of Dental Research, and only dental nerds like me read that journal. And so it's like nobody saw this, and the news media didn't pick it up. And so, you know, that went what by virtually unnoticed, and it was the same study and the same data. So we know that xylitol has a, 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 I would consider that a significant effect on patients that are, are at risk for root surface lesions. This was a study that was done and published just this last year. They looked at 54, 5 to 14 year olds in, in grade school and middle school and they got them to volunteer and they followed them for a period of a month and they had them, uh, they had a preloaded toothbrush with a 49% by weight xylitol uh, toothpaste that they gave, a paste that they gave to them and they gave them uh, after lunch every day these kids agreed to brush their teeth with the xylitol and uh, the reduction in plaque level was you know, significant. Now, was that because they were, you know, brushing and being instructed on how to brush? Or did the xylitol have a have a role in that? I mean, I think you know we have to be careful in what conclusions we make, but certainly, um, in the study using the xylitol, it greatly reduced their plaque levels. Um, so, again, I think that xylitol is appropriate in, in in toothpaste as well. Now, this was just published, and this is from the Cochrane database. And and for those of you familiar with the Cochrane, you know, reports. Uh, this is probably our best independent uh, reports for our scientific literature. They go through and do meta-analysis, systematic reviews. They look at, at studies. They try and get rid of as much bias as they can. They're an independent organization, so uh, they try not to have any outside influence, and then they take and look at the data. So this is probably the best um, interpretation of the data that we can depend on. And what their conclusion here was, we really, you know, found questionable benefit for xylitol. Um, there were a couple of studies that they included that had um, found that xylitol with fluoride toothpaste was better than fluoride toothpaste alone. But one of the conclusions they made is insufficient for us to determine whether or not, you know, xylitol-containing products can prevent caries in adults, infants, or children. And um, and there's a risk of bias due to the fact that. The two studies that showed a, demonstrated a positive result were both uh, done by the same researchers. So, you know, you, you always have to look at bias there as well. So, you know, we get a Cochrane report, and so uh, it says we don't, you know, we don't have enough evidence to say whether it's good or bad. So, you know, what do we do with that? Do we conclude that xylitol, you know, doesn't have any benefit? Well, I mean, that, somebody could draw that conclusion by reading that study. But then I weigh that against all of the other evidence that we have, this other scientific studies, that demonstrate you know significant benefits for xylitol, and and um, I'm not going to stop using it, right? I mean, I'm not going to stop using xylitol or, or recommending it. Um, and this was just a uh, another study done, uh, 562 five to six year olds. They were given xylitol gummy bears, um, and then they were reexamined when they were in second grade, and they looked for their DMF S scores. And you know the carriage progression in the permanent teeth was minimal, suggesting that uh, whether they had the gummy bears or not um, didn't really show any significant impact. But it may have been that there were other things going on simultaneously, like fluoride, fluoride in the water, fluoride in their toothpaste, that may have been uh, masking the actual benefit of xylitol. So you know we get into some of these studies, and you know is there benefit or not? Um, you know based on the study, we don't know. Certainly, xylitol is a you know we know it is a five carbon sugar polyol, a sugar alcohol. Um, it's not metabolized by most of these bacteria in the biofilm, and so that uh, it should tend to kind of reduce their uh, metabolic rate, you know, and make life more challenging for them, uh, you know. And so here's just a review that was published this last fall and looked at the benefits of xylitol, and, and I think again that that's something I'm going to continue to recommend for my patients. But recognizing that you know the Cochrane report didn't find significant benefits, and and there have been some studies that uh, didn't have great outcomes. Um, and then you get studies like this. This was just published uh, this year, the International again Journal of Pediatric Dentistry. They took 601 mothers, uh, and this was a review, that, uh, 11 a systematic review. There was 11 uh, random controlled trials that they included in the review. Uh, there were 601 total moms, 
and they looked at you know their DMFT scores and mothers using um, xylitol gum, and then also looked at the uh, mutant streptococci levels, and it was significant. You know, they follow them over a period of these studies over a period of two years, and so we know that that you know. If you can significantly reduce the plaque level and the mutant streptococci level in your children, you know, from the parent to child, you know, I, that's a significant thing that we can help help mothers and counsel them on. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with tonight is, you know, we're talking about diet. So basically, if you've got a patient that has a dietary risk factor, they're either consuming too much sugar, or they're eating too frequently, or they're consuming sugar-sweetened beverages, and those are issues. Um, as you talk to them and try and coach them through making behavioral change in their life, one of the things that I think that we have to be um, aware of, sugar is so addictive um, and such a challenge and it's such a part of our diet is in every food that you look at. I mean, if you're buying processed foods, uh, it's literally ev it's put in everything. Um, this was a study that this came out of New Zealand. It was a systematic review. That was there were interventions uh, for you know behavioral change. There were five uh, clinical trials included in this review, and what they found was that literally in a dental setting, one-on-one -on -one dietary interventions can change a patient's behavior. <clears throat> However, the evidence indicated that it was harder to get a patient to change their behavior around sugar than it is to get them to change their behavior around alcohol consumption and you know and and fruits and vegetables in their diet. So, you know, I think the one thing that we need to be aware of is you're you're talking about sugar, which is extremely addictive, and it's harder to get a patient to make changes around sugar in their diet than it is about having them change their alcohol behavior, which we know takes 12 steps and is not easy. So uh, just be aware of the fact that I don't, I don't have all the answers for this, and it's a challenge. And if so, if you find it challenging and frustrating at times, you're not alone. I mean, I think we're all. I know that we can make impact, and I have made impacts on patients, but it's certainly, um, certainly a challenge for all of us. So I think it's just something we need to be, you know, aware of. So that, uh, that's what I had to present tonight. I hope you found that interesting. I hope that I've kind of broadened your. Uh, perspective on how diet influence carries risk, you know, the latest research that we have on sugar itself, sugar sweetened beverages, and xylitol. <clears throat> so if, uh, Cody, if there's, I, we're, we're in great shape tonight on time. Um, I, I, I rambled right along, so we've got time for a few questions. I'm sure that we have a few questions tonight. And uh, certainly if you're, uh, you're interested in learning more about, you know, risk assessment or learning more about carry free specifically, you know, call us, let us help you. Perfect. Yes, we had a lot of questions come in, a lot of feedback. So I hope you're ready for some of these. There's some good ones. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. <laughs> so I, I think all the first one I picked out here, um, and, and he answered this a little bit in a lot of the slides, but I think it's a good point um, to focus on anyways. So is there a difference in the effect between eating the natural sugars in healthy fruits like bananas? Uh, versus processed sugars and, and other foods, processed foods, that sort of thing? You know, Cody, um, that's a really good question. And I don't, I, I would have to tell you I'm going to give you my opinion. And it's an educated opinion, but uh, I haven't seen any scientific literature um, where they studied natural or existing sugars versus uh, sugars in processed foods uh, as that being a different, uh, being making a difference in, in terms of have, particularly having an effect on on dental caries. Um, and in fact, that brings up a really interesting question that I had this week that I want to share right, at, right as soon as I talk about this, Cody. Um, typically, the sugars, the level of sugars found in um, fruits, you know, some of these fruits and what have you, and berries and vegetables. You've got some fructose there. Um, you know, which is basically glu glucose and you know and sucrose. So you've got some of these uh, sucroses, fructose and glucose combined. You know, so you've got a combination of these sugars, but they tend to be in fairly low levels. And what's uh, certainly like eating a handful of berries is a lot less risky in terms of your sugar consumption than drinking one Coca-Cola or one cola drink or one sugar sweetened beverage soda of your choice. 
um, when you look at how many teaspoons of sugar are there. So it's like eating these fruits and vegetables, you're probably getting more fiber and less sugar, but the sugar itself really isn't that much different. I mean, it's sugar is sugar, you know, so whether it, uh, it's in the naturally, organically in the fruit and vegetable or whether it's been processed out of sugar cane or sugar beets and then added to your crackers, um, you know, if you consume the same amount of sugar, it's going to probably have the same net effect. And now, obviously, there'll be, you know, some complex carbohydrates and some protein, other things that will uh, play a role in that, and particularly if you look at um, your diet in general and your glycemic index and glycemic load, that's a whole different story. But we're just talking about uh, bacteria digesting the sugar in the mouth, producing acid, and contributing to dental caries. <clears throat> so the answer is, I don't know, but... Certainly, I think it's probably a better dietary idea to have a banana than to eat at one time than to eat a bag of M&Ms. You know, I mean, that's where I would start, or to drink a, a, a can of a sugar-sweetened beverage. Now, one of the interesting questions that I had this week is somebody asked me, is, is what's the difference between organic and natural xylitol? <laughs> I was kind of taken back by the question because it's like, well, I'm not really sure I've ever seen that categorized specifically, and it could be xylitol manufacturers trying to create some distinction because the FDA certainly doesn't recognize any categories like that. Um, and the question was, and I think they've probably been told by some organic health food site that you know organic is better than natural and what have you, but. I guess in my mind, I would interpret xylit organic xylitol. The, our, our bodies actually produce xylitol in a very trace amount, and xylitol is found in some um, some fruits and stuff in very small amounts as well. It's certainly also found in uh, corn husk, and it's found well not xylitol, but xylan is found in corn husk, and also uh, birch tree bark. And xylan is xylan, like sucrose is sucrose. Whether you get your sucrose from a sugar cane or a sugar beet. Uh, it's chemically indistinguishable, and the same thing happens with xylitol, whether you take it from a corn husk or whether you take it from uh, birch bark, uh, xylan and xylan, it's just a chemical, and it's, uh, you know, it's the same. The biggest question for me would be, what's the purity of the xylitol that you're using? That's more important than whether it came from a birch tree or, or a corn husk, in my mind, and so, so all the xylitol that we use is USP grade, it's pharmaceutical grade, so it's the highest quality available. So that's like, in my mind, a bigger issue than is it quote unquote organic or quote unquote natural, but you know, these questions, uh, there's a lot of marketing hype that gets created and, and without any scientific support or evidence, and certainly there haven't been any studies in dental caries where they specified here we used uh, organic xylitol in this study versus uh, this study where we use natural xylitol. So, you know, some of these terms, uh, it, it gets a little crazy out there. But anyway, I just wanted to okay. share that because I thought because I thought it was an interesting question, and maybe some some people who are online tonight may may have had that same question. Anyway, so I tried. To yeah, I, I think in conversations that I've had with offices too, I think that is something that gets brought up from you know from the patient's point of view quite a bit too. Right. Okay. Um, so the, the next one, uh, and I like this question because it's a little bit more about maybe the conversations that you might be having with patients. Um, and she says, I struggle knowing that I want to make the best recommendation for my patients, but I find it hard to ask patients to completely remove sugar from their diet. It, it usually proves unsuccessful. How do you approach this conversation? Well, you know, Cody, and that, that's another, I like that question. That's a great question as well. Um, <laughs> I don't think if you ask a patient or recommend that they take all sugar out of their diet that that's going to be successful. I mean, it's going to be that's, that that would be a challenge for any of us to be able to do that, uh, you know. Um, but I think it's really important just to educate them in terms of um, the risk that how they eat the sugar, how much sugar they eat and the frequency that they have the sugar, whether it's in a sugar-sweetened beverage, certainly those are conversations where we can help educate our patient. And you, you're maybe not going to, by telling them to floss, isn't going to make them start flossing, or explaining even the benefits of why they should floss, uh, isn't going to make a patient start flossing. And telling a patient why they should quit eating sugar probably isn't going to make them take the sugar out of their diet. But I tell you, one of the people that I've met in the last year, and I, and I absolutely love this lady, 
is Dr. Chirone Lodog. And everybody, if you have questions like this, particularly on diet and nutrition, she is just a wonderful resource. She She's a physician. She's a Native American. She practiced. She taught alternative medicine at University of Arizona for 20 years. You can look her up on the on the internet. She has written several books. But the one thing I like about Tirone <coughs> is she says, "Don't get crazy. Just pick one thing and change it. Like here's all the things that we know we should do in our in our own diet, right? In our own lifestyle. And instead of trying to be crazy about it and change all these things, and and this is a coaching um, belief as well." It's hard enough just to change one thing. So don't try and start by recommending that the patient change like everything they eat and drink, and you know all at one time. Just lay these out, and you know, and and tell the patient it's like you know no, you don't have to be crazy. Just pick one thing and, and start working on that, because you know Rome wasn't built in a day. I mean, let's just make some slow, gradual process or progress here, but you know, intentionally make some of those changes. But just pick one thing, and because I think we can all kind of be successful. And then once you're successful at changing one thing, you know, you're gonna look at the next thing and go, hey, let's try that. let's try doing that now. You know, and, and success breeds success. So it's really important to uh, to do that. But her last name is Low Dog, L O W and then Dog, D O G. First name Tirone. Uh, T I E R A O N A. Uh, but you know, if you have questions on nutrition and supplements and all of that, I mean she's just an incredible resource. So I'd certainly rec strongly recommend her. Great question, Cody. Great. Great. Okay, so the the last one that, that we have here is is a shorter question. I don't know how long the uh, the answer will be, but uh, can xylitol alone be an effective treatment? Um, you know, you know, yes and no. Um, I think that certainly the uh, if you look at the results from that the secondary analysis of the exact study, uh, the patients that had that were at high risk for root surface lesions. Xylitol alone was the only intervention in that xylitol mints, and it reduced their their um, DMFT, their their carries rate by 40%. Um, so I would say, you know, the short answer to that is yes. The the better answer is no because I think we're always better off to pair it with multiple strategies at the same time. Not that I want them doing like I just said, do one thing. But if I could have them do one thing, and that strategy had already incorporated uh, a pH strategy, a, a remineralization strategy like nanohydroxyapatite, you know, fluoride and xylitol, and that's all combined into one change for them versus, or you know, one strategy, one product versus just having a product of xylitol alone, I would pick the one that had the, the shotgun strategy. So, and you know, our scientific research, even in a lot of human behavioral trials addressing more than one of those things simultaneously, if you could do it, is always a better plan. So um, I would approach it from that standpoint. Yes, it can be effective if it's targeted to the right uh, risk factor, particularly in that study, or you know, looking at xylitol gum, reducing the transmission rate of mutant streptococci from mother to child, or in their plaque levels and their you know, DMFT scores. But better yet, let's, let's uh, you know, include three or four other strategies and at the same time, because they're probably gonna be um, probably going to be more effective, and certainly John Featherstone's study, you know, where he described the the, the Canberra effect, uh, the net result of doing all of these things together actually produced a greater result than the sum of the parts. So um, anytime you can cluster those things, I think it's a better idea. So that's a great question. Good. Good. Well, awesome. I think that. We'll about do it in terms of uh, time. So thank you, uh, Dr. Cooch, and again, thank you to everybody else uh, joining us that was on tonight. We've had a lot of feedback come in, so uh, look for answers to those over the next few days. We'll get to those uh, and send them out via email. Um, if there's a part of the webinar that you want to hear again as well, we'll send out a recording, so look for that. Uh, and you see here on the screen, uh, contact us if you want to learn more about implementing carry free into your practice. Um, if you're interested in scheduling a, kind of a team meeting for, for you and the team both. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, and have an awesome evening, everybody. Yep. Everybody have an awesome week. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Good night.